What do you say? How about a little diversion from what's going on outside these four walls? Hey there, it's Teddy coming to you from down in my record room with yet another vinyl orgy. Uh, where we last left off, I was getting ready to head to Italy to uh, see my daughter who was performing uh, in an opera over in the Tuscany area. And I did make it over, uh, had an incredible time. Just, I've been to Italy before, but not in the Tuscany area. And that was just, just fantastic. Uh, prior to going, uh, my good friend Anders, uh, Anders in Stockholm, um, hooked me up with uh, another friend of his, a uh, record collector in Florence, um, who uh, Anders said just has an incredible, like, world class jazz collection. But we missed each other by literally one day. He was heading out uh, to holiday. Uh, on the day I was coming in. So that didn't work out. But he did uh, tell me that uh, most of the record shops in, uh, in that region um, weren't going to have the types of things that I was looking for. Uh, generally, they were going to have just standard reissues. Uh, I did poke my head into one shop and uh, confirmed uh, exactly what he said. So I was free uh, to not think about records. I just had a great time with, you know, food, wine, museums, family, friends. It was just great. Uh, but now, uh, you know, the bill has come due. It was an unplanned trip. So I've been... Uh, Working on uh, paying off that trip, which means no records coming in the door um, and no records coming in the door in the uh, foreseeable future. As a matter of fact, I've been thinning out the collection to help uh, pay things off. I've probably pulled about 300 records out and uh, sold them to uh, some stores here locally. Um, not interested in doing the Discogs rebate thing. I want to kind of pump it back into our local economy. But uh, hey, don't feel sad for me because there's plenty back here. There's plenty over here that you don't see. Um, so for uh, this final orgy, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around and pull one record from each major section of my collection. So not going to be uh, an abundance of jazz in this particular video, uh, but I will uh, pull another jazz record at the end that uh, is just, in my opinion, uh, a masterpiece and one of my uh, favorite uh, LPs in the entire collection. So stay tuned for that. And uh, yeah, so hey, let's get to it. Well, first up is a pull from my jazz section, and it's one of the last records that I got before heading off to Italy. Uh, Allison Miller, the amazing, gifted drummer and composer, uh, came through town with her group Boom Tick Boom. Uh, just such a cool gig, and uh, I scored a vinyl copy of her latest release directly from one Ms. Miller. Uh, it's called Otis Was a Polar Bear, and it's on the Royal Potato Family label. Uh, incredibly diverse group uh, that is dealing with incredibly diverse music. Generally, uh, Miller's compositions uh, on this record are upbeat, uh, but they are uh, tightly composed and uh, tightly arranged but all through uh, the soul of a drummer. Um, so songs, even within songs, can get, uh, get quite varied uh, in feel and time signature, things like that. As I said, the group is incredibly diverse. Um, of course, Miller on drums, 
uh, Todd Sikafus on bass. So he's really holding it down back there, with uh, which allows her to uh, run wild. Um, you've got a front line of uh, Kirk Kanufke on cornet, just a beautifully lyrical player who can also get dirty. He can get down into uh, some Lester buoy territory of uh, vocalizations and growling and such. And he's up there with Ben Goldberg, a clarinetist, uh, seemingly uh, unusual um, instrument in jazz these days. But he can uh, dig into some Eastern European territory along with getting out and, and quite avant-garde and free. Uh, very cool. Uh, you've got Jenny Scheinman on violin, who comes from kind of a, uh, I would say, an avant folk uh, vibe. Uh, she's not coming through kind of traditional uh, jazz violin territory of like Joe Venuti and Stuff Smith, Stefan Grappelli. Now it's more more folky, um, but man, she can get very conceptual with her playing and uh, very cool. But more than anything. I was there to see the pianist of the group, Myra Melford, who, for my money, is just about one of the best pianists going these days. She's so versed uh, in, you know, the entire history of jazz, in blues. Uh, I know she studied blues and boogie-woogie piano in Chicago, but also studied with Don Pullen, the great Don Pullen, and so... Man, she can support like nobody's business and then just drop these <laughs> free bombs that are just, they just make you smile. And uh, yeah, and just very, very flexible mind at work there. So yeah, very diverse group. Um, and, uh, but as I said, you know, a lot of the music is upbeat. There was one song in here, though, that really knocked me out. And knocked. it's on this album, too, and it's called uh, The Listener for Josh Cantor. And uh, Allison explained at the gig that Josh Cantor was a neighbor of hers, and he was one of us. He was a record collector and, and just knew a ton of stuff. And if she had a question for, hey, you know, who was on such and such an album, who produced this, that, he could pull the answer out. And uh, But he uh, unfortunately passed away, and she dedicated a song to him, and it was it, it, it's a very dirge-like uh, song, but about halfway through, as Myra Melford is just going through these very kind of dirge-like chords, Allison Miller is soloing back there, and I've never heard drums cry before. I mean, there you you can sense the the tears and and the sadness in, in her drums, and I was just blown away. And and partly because you know you've got an artist who's dedicating a song to us, and. Uh, you know, for for every musical artist, you need a musical listener, and it and she recognizes the the symbiotic relationship that's that's necessary for this to uh, continue, go forward, have success. So, anyway, very cool. Allison Miller's "Boom Tick Boom." Otis was a polar bear from this year, two thousand sixteen, on Royal Potato Family Records. I saw your face. Well, digging into the rock section, uh, I offer up Alejandro Escovedo and A Man Under the Influence. A trace. Um, this originally came out uh, as a CD in, in uh, 2001, uh, but was reissued in 2009. It's on uh, Bloodshot Records. And Alejandro Escovedo, for me, is... Uh, about the best singer-songwriter uh, to emerge uh, since Neil Young. Uh, he actually came up through the uh, kind of the cowpunk 
um, era uh, with groups like um, oh, Wall of Voodoo, but he was in a group called uh, Rank and File. But uh, he found this uh, singer-songwriter voice, and um, and like you know all good singer-songwriters, he can really uh, plumb the depths of uh, you know variety of uh, human emotion and experiences, and um, yeah, and he does it here so well. Um, this album was produced by uh, Chris Stamey. Uh, who was in the DBs and uh, and also one of the guitar players and another guitar player is on here is Mitch Easter who uh, of course produced some of the early REM records so these guys are uh, you know coming out of that jangle pop uh, thing and uh, don't really employ it quite so much on here but you would think with uh, these producers in there that it might be you know, too many cooks in the kitchen, but uh, oh no! Uh, I mean, what what they walked out with was was something that I, I just feel is a near perfect album. Um, this uh, actually is a double album, and what they did. Um, so it says, uh, "Man Under the Influence," the deluxe Bourbonitis edition. Uh, he had another album uh, called Bourbonitis Blues that they plucked uh, uh, some of that to uh, fill out the double album. Um, and that material is also great. But one of the things that, uh, that, that I love about the sound of this album and uh, also part of Bourbonitis Blues is that uh, uh, he's utilizing uh, a cellist and a violin player. So you get this very warm... Uh, very uh, kind of lush sound at times. Uh, it's not on every song. I mean, there's some just a couple of, you know, just straight up rockers on here as well. So it, uh, it mines some, uh, a variety of territory. Great lyricist. I like his voice too. And uh, if you're not familiar, puts on a, a great live show <laughs> as well. Um, he has an affinity for Kansas City and uh, finds his way here quite often. But uh, yeah, just uh, really, really cool, classy stuff. Uh, Alejandro Escovedo, A Man Under the Influence. Uh, this is a 2009 release on Bloodshot Records. <laughs> Well, moving over to the classical section, uh, I pulled a 20th century beauty uh, by Ned Roram. It's called Air Music. Uh, this is a 1987 release on the first edition records label, which was a, a label started and run by the Louisville Orchestra that uh, contains a lot of uh, very, very interesting uh, material. I came to this record because of Henry Threadgill, uh, of all people. Um, Henry Threadgill won uh, the most recent Pulitzer Prize in music. And uh, that was a little bit of a shocker because you don't normally see uh, a jazz-oriented uh, player uh, winning that award. I got curious and started to research uh, other uh, Pulitzer Prize winning music uh, winners and uh, and curious about what's on vinyl and uh, it's been a very very pleasurable pursuit uh, as of late um, so uh, Ned Roram won the Pulitzer Prize in 1976 for air music and uh, this is uh, yeah it's uh, 10 variations for orchestra. So each variation is kind of a, a musical poem in and of itself. Uh, it, uh, it's, so you get different combinations, almost more like uh, uh, chamber music at times. Um, now Ned Roram 
for some people, is more known uh, as an author. Uh, he's made quite a name for himself in literary circles. And musically, he's uh, a little bit more known for writing art songs, um, classically based songs that uh, use uh, poem uh, as text. And so, uh, yeah, he's he, he a little bit more known in that regard. So this, 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 uh, this was quite an interesting, uh, enhancement, uh, to his career. But, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, I've really, uh, come to, uh, enjoy 20th century, uh, classical music as much as I love and do deeply love, uh, improvised music. Uh, I find, um, the you know compositions that are you know avant-garde uh, based and and uh, in practice just fascinating as well and uh, this is just a, a beautifully moody evocative dynamic uh, work and uh, boy you know when an orchestra with with that you know, plethora of acoustic instruments, you know, comes at you so strong. It's very, very impressive stuff. So now uh, one, I, I do want to read you a little quote because it's like, well, what does air music have to do, you know, with anything that's presented here? And uh, Roram wrote, and, and this is on a insert in the, uh, the album, uh, he, when he was done, uh, he came upon a quote uh, that he found to be uh, quite compelling. He said, uh, uh, Music touches the nerves in a particular manner and results in a singular playfulness, a quite special communication that cannot be described in words. Music represents the inner feeling in the exterior air. Really cool. That's a quote from uh, around the 1800s, early 1800s. And uh, so uh, he latched onto that and entitled his piece uh, Air Music. So again, very, very cool. And uh, 1987 release on first edition records, Air Music by the composer Ned Roram. Let me sing you a song about Vegas town and a poor old Howard Hughes locked up there in his hotel suite trying to find his shoes so when he got so much to lose Well, next up is from my country bluegrass section. It's a 1972 release on Warner Brothers by the late, great John Hartford. Uh, it's called Morning Bugle. And John Hartford was one of the lucky ones. Uh, he wrote uh, the song Gentle on My Mind, which was a, uh, you know, multi-million, jillion, zillion seller for Glenn Campbell. And that afforded Hartford the opportunity to pursue music in the way that he wanted to pursue it moving forward until the day that he passed away. And uh, what he was interested in was um, a variation on bluegrass. Uh, it could be said that he uh, could be considered a founder of uh, so-called new grass. But that's um, uh, basically what he did was to plant the bluegrass flag uh, within the counterculture landscape. So it has kind of a hippie aesthetic uh, applied to the tradition of bluegrass. It's not the, um, it's more laid back. It's not uh, the high octane uh, bluegrass and, and harmony vocals that uh, you might uh, think of. But uh, Hartford is just an incredibly gifted writer. Um, there is a, uh, a, a wit uh, to his lyrics and it's delivered in this uh, deliciously um, wry monotone vocal style uh, that he offers up. So there's there's a uh, a gentle wink 
uh, and his smile along the way uh, through uh, many of his records. Uh, but it's played beautifully. Uh, it's a trio setting with Hartford uh, on uh, banjo and uh, fiddle. Uh, he's accompanied with Norman Blake, the great Norman Blake, uh, doing some uh, flat picking on guitar. And are you ready for this? The bass player is none other than one, Dave Holland. Yep, Dave Holland uh, uh, playing a little uh, bluegrass, but he brings a completely different feel to it uh, than uh, you could imagine. So it makes it incredibly cool. Basically, these are recorded, you know, live to tape, uh, produced by John Simon, who uh, helped the band out uh, in their early efforts. Um, yeah, just really, 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 should I say it one more time? Yes, really cool record. An all-time fave. Morning Bugle, 1972, John Hartford, on uh, Warner Brothers. Yeah. Now, when I was a young boy, at the age of five. All right, some blues. I love the blues. And it is so essential a music to so much other music. And this is from one of its masters, obviously. Muddy Waters, and this is one of the greatest comeback records that you will ever hear. Uh, it's from 1977 called Hard Again on Blue Sky Records. And up until this point, Muddy Waters had essentially been left for dead by Chess Records. And the guitarist, Johnny Winter, brought him into the studio with the respect that he fully deserved, surrounded him with superb musicians and an environment of joy. I mean, joy just exudes out of the grooves from this record. It's almost like a, a blues frat house. These guys are having so much fun. Uh, Muddy Waters is reunited with the great James Cotton on harmonica, so it is high caliber material. Uh, there is uh, new songs that he uh, wrote uh, for a good chunk of this album. And Winter produced it in a very old school, sparse manner, and it sounds incredible. I mean, for those of you who have more uh, high end audiophile systems, you'll get your mileage out of this baby. It is uh, phenomenal sounding. This album kicked off a, a whole new. Uh, uh, phase to Muddy Waters' career, um, and this rediscovery, uh, you know, propelled him onward and uh, until he passed away. I had the great fortune of meeting and hanging out with Muddy Waters not too long after this album was released, hanging out in his dressing room, and I'll tell you, uh, it is a Class A gentleman. Um uh, Everything that he went through, um, he, he just didn't bother him uh, in the long run. He just uh, he just worked it, worked the crowd, worked his music, just worked it. And uh, yeah, well, I was gonna have a bad joke there, something about his mojo working, but I'm I'm not gonna do that. Um, anyway, again, phenomenal record. I love, don't get me wrong, I love his early material on chess from the late 40s through uh, most of the 50s. And that is essential to a blues catalog. This album, Hard Again, is essential as well. Just a phenomenal record. 1977. Hard Again by the great Muddy Waters. Well, next up is from the World Music Shelf, and this is a 1981 release called Phases of the Moon, 
traditional Chinese music. And it was released on the CBS Masterworks label, which uh, was the classical arm uh, to Columbia Records. So this is a very, very well-produced, well-considered album. A compilation made up of uh, songs that were recorded um, uh, from earlier decades, but it still sounds uh, really good. What's unexpected here is that it's traditional music played by a large Chinese orchestra, uh, up to 70 musicians at times. So it has this lush grandeur that is unexpected. And the songs kind of drift between uh, uplifting and melancholy. Uh, it's very thought-provoking material. Um, it's very relaxing material. Um, but the, the largeness of scale uh, is so uh, different than what you might think or <laughs> uh, music that you uh, might hear down at your uh, you know, local Chinese restaurant. Uh, yeah, very different. Um, as I said, a very well-considered package. Um, uh, there, the liner notes include uh, notes about the instruments that are played. So I always like to get some um, context, further context to uh, music that I'm less familiar with. And uh, yeah, so that that is just top notch as well. So yeah, if you're looking to uh, relax a little bit and uh, drift off and let your thoughts uh open up to uh, some cool visualizations. Phases of the Moon, traditional Chinese music, uh, could be your ticket. Uh, it's from 1981 on CBS Masterworks. Mm-mm-mm. They all said Louis was not having it was written well I have here a really interesting pull from my folk section and this is a recommend uh, from Jeff Record Man 1958 uh, a name from the past that uh, some of you uh, longtime V Sears will uh, recognize but yeah I have to thank Jeff very much I knew nothing about this and uh, it's a real diamond in the rough in the folk realm. Uh, it's a 1970 release on Electra from uh, singer-songwriter Paul Siebel. And uh, Paul Siebel released two albums on Electra, and then he just uh, receded uh, into the shadows um, and uh, was uh, hardly seen again. Uh, so this was left behind, and uh, very, very happy that it was. But uh, as I said, it was just utterly unknown to me. Um, Siebel is, uh, you know, a singer-songwriter who is uh, kind of a cross between John Prine, uh, Bob Dylan, and uh, the late great Chicago folky Steve Goodman, um, if you're familiar with him. So. Uh, the songs are, are very uh, well-constructed short stories, very literate uh, music. Um, he, uh, you might be familiar with, with one of the songs off of here called Louise. Uh, it was recorded by various people. I first became aware of it uh, through Leo Kotke. I think Bonnie Raitt recorded it as well, uh, among others. Uh, but this... Uh, is one of those instances where uh, magic occurred. I mean, he had very little money and very little time in the studio. Uh, he went in there with the likes of David Bromberg on guitar and uh, Richard Green on violin. And uh, in very, very short order, just, you know, everything fell into place just, just right. Um, and what they walked out with you know, is a real gem of country-tinged folk, which uh, was starting, uh, you know, the, the country influence was, was beginning to uh, make itself known in, you know, folk and, and rock at this time. And uh, 
this is a really cool example of that if you're uh, if you're into that kind of thing. But uh, as I said, just you know, a real diamond in the rough in the in the folk realm, and uh, so so happy that uh, Jeff pointed me towards this. So again, it's Paul Siebel, uh, Wood Smoke and Oranges from 1970 on Electra Records. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> ready for some funk I mean the real shit yeah Mickey and the Soul Generation this is a uh, 2002 compilation release on the Cali Tex label this was uh, put together by Mickey and the Soul Generation fanboy deluxe DJ Shadow and of course it's his label as well but uh he fell into uh, finding, you know, some of their material and then just researching his ass off, contacting the group, finding out what material they had. So this is made up of uh, 45s that were produced, demos that they produced, some live music as well. And whoa. <laughs> yeah, if you think of um, uh, the JB's crossed with the meters and then dirty that up man it is chunky funky stuff and it is unreal fantastic uh the group is made up of uh two tenor saxes you know bass drums guitar and uh, mickey mickey foster on organ particular shout out to uh George Salas, the guitar player. There's some incredible wah-wah work uh, that you'll hear on this record. But yeah, you know, they uh, they got together in San Antonio, Texas in uh, the late 60s and eked their way, you know, until uh, the later 70s and gave it up. They had moments where uh, they were an opening act for people like James Brown and uh, the Supremes, Cool and the Gang, people like this. But they just never got that break uh, that sometimes is required to, you know, just get over the hump and uh, get to another level. But uh, it just never happened for uh, Mickey and the Soul Generation. But uh, thanks to uh, Josh Davis, G DJ Shadow, uh, he got, uh, you know, the ball rolling again. Uh, for them and uh, uh, I know this album is uh, out of print but um, the great uh, Numero group out of Chicago has uh, reissued this uh, they've added more material I think it's a three record set for like 30 bucks that you can get from the Numero group so the material is still out there and uh, just waiting for you to get down with it. It is just amazing shit. Really is. <laughs> Love it to death. Um, Mickey and the Soul Generation. The album's called Iron Leg, which was uh, uh, kind of their minor hit of sorts. And uh, compilation released on Calitex Records from 2002. Well, for me, I saved the best for last and uh, went back into the jazz section and have pulled homage to Charles Parker. Uh, it's a 1979 Black Saint release from the trombonist George Lewis, and it features Anthony Davis on piano, Douglas Ewart on various reeds, and Richard Teitelbaum on various electronics. Uh, George Lewis, um, as I said, the, uh, the great trombonist and educator came up through the AACM ranks 
along with Douglas Ewart, and uh, created a 20th century masterpiece, uh, in my view, and it's a, it's a desert island situation for me. Um, there are two cuts, uh, one per side. Uh, one is called the blues, but I'm going to focus, and I, it, it's a great number as well, but I just never can get past uh, the title cut, homage to Charles Parker. Um, it's an 18-minute cut that's kind of uh, split into two uh, sections. Um, the song itself has nothing to do with Parker's music. It has nothing to do with uh, bebop music per se, but it's a it's a metaphorical uh, composition um, of, that's dealing with uh, the spirit of Charlie Parker and how George Lewis uh, interprets that. Uh, the cut starts with this murky, uh, ethereal landscape. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's created by uh, placing contact mics on a couple of cymbals and, and, and as they are played and touched, rubbed, scratch that uh, it's processed through uh, some of Richard Teitelbaum's electronics and it is a um, a very primordial um, landscape that uh, almost uh, has the feel of like in the womb and uh, the second part of the song is almost like a, a, a rebirth of the spirit of Charles Parker into a new dimension. And that is articulated through a very um, slowly evolving um, melodic consciousness with the introduction of uh, the other instruments. Uh, it begins with uh, Douglas Ewart on alto, just very beautifully, um, gaining um, his legs, so to speak. And uh, Anthony Davis uh, comes in and they are working together and then it releases to Anthony Davis uh, doing just absolutely wonderfully beautiful solo. He continues on and supports uh, George Lewis, who... Uh, uh, ends the piece uh, with his trombone, but it 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 proves that avant-garde jazz can be drop dead gorgeous. Um, when I listen to this piece, I get lost in it so quickly, and uh, time is suspended, and I just drift with it and. Uh, I have other, other thoughts every time I listen to it. Now, every time I, I, I experience this piece, it's, it's a different uh, visceral response that I have. It's just wonderful. And I have to thank Bob Taylor. Thank you, Bob, for uh, letting this copy go and for it to enter my collection and my consciousness and uh, yeah, it's the real deal um, for me. So I urge you to check it out and see what you think. But you got to give it, you got to give it the room and the headspace to to really let this thing open up for you. And uh, yeah, it's great. So anyway. Well, that's it for uh, this Vinyl Orgy. I really uh, thank those of you <laughs> that are still hanging in there with this and uh, my ramblings, but uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate all you old, old, uh, old subscribers. I appreciate the new ones that have come on in the last few months. Um, I appreciate your comments. Um, I will respond and do respond to each and every one of you. So uh, 
in these very, very interesting times. Seriously, do what you can to keep it in the groove. And I'll see you next time.